Hi everyone, it's nice to be here again. Uh, I was here in 2014 and it just grows and it gets more fun. Uh, in this talk we're gonna share some inside and actually even literally inside information from the area of public transport data. My name is Ulrika Park and I'm a product lead at Nobina and this is... Uh, I'm Petter Kvarnfors and I'm a developer manager at Nobina IT. And um, <coughs> what is Nobina? I don't know if uh, many of you have heard about it. I know at least uh, one in the audience. Uh, Nobina is uh, the largest bus operator in the Nordic countries and our business is to transport people usually by bus. But uh, nowadays, the business also includes this little thing with, which gets even more important for the whole journey. And some days I uh, start to think that it actually gets, start to get as important as the engine. So, uh, about one and a half year ago, for the Stockholm region, uh, Nobina adopted the travel planner Resi Stockholm, uh, which is one of the, uh, which is the largest uh, app in Stockholm for travel planning. And uh, those of you who have an iPhone probably have it on it, but there is also an Android version. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the challenges we have with when we start to work with this app. We have been uh, driving buses for over the 100 years and start to be pretty good at that. But this is new and also the data behind it is very new. So I'm um, going to share some, some learnings from it. And we hope to inspire you to, after this session, go home and either professionally or as a hobby, start to play around with the data that exists and contribute to this exciting area and improve the way we travel in our everyday life. First, I will give you a little bit of background about this app. Uh, it was uh, built about eight years ago, the first version, from, uh, by a guy called Eric, a happy coder, who was a little bit tired of going into SL's web page every day to search for his travel time. Or for the, and for those of you who don't know, uh, SL is the, public, is the authority for public transport in the Stockholm region. And he was a bit tired of that, so he decided to build an app for it, but there were no data available, so he scraped SL's web page. And this app got very popular very quickly, and also other apps followed. So pretty quickly, SL had no choice but to publish, start to publish their data. And this shows us how much influence, influence one happy coder can have on the availability of data for our everyday lives. Uh, so SL decided to, okay, let's, let's publish it uh, now. And conveniently enough, they could use this community that was kind of recently uh, been started, Trafik Lab. I don't know how many here have worked somewhat with Trafik Lab APIs. Yeah, a few. Yeah, that's great. I would love to hear about it. Uh, Trafik Lab is a community that was initiated by Sam Trafiken, which is an organization that has the mission to gather and publish data for public transport. And now you can, <coughs> in this uh, platform, you can find data for almost all Sweden. You can find uh, time schedules, real-time data. You can find information about uh, interruptions and stops and a lot more. So this is all great, right? They publish it and now everything is fine and easy. Or is it? <laughs> no, no, anyone who, who have uh, worked with public APIs know that there are a lot of challenges. And of course we have it too. So what have happened since uh, these apps have grown and uh, the data is more available is that we have 
just for our app, we have over half a million users every month who totally rely on this data, this information, for planning their days. So the tiniest little error in the data can have severe consequences. Someone might miss her brother's wedding or another really important appointment at her doctor or something. So even though the, some of these APIs just recently got a bit stable, the people in Stockholm totally rely on this. And if they're not using our app, they use another app that also uses the same data. So we need to uh, take care and have responsibility for these people. And uh, <coughs> the challenges we have is, for instance, we have there can be certain stops, they show the wrong time. So this person who always use the app, suddenly in one spot, it's not working. But they don't have a backup information. They don't know what, who to call <laughs> or what to do. So we need to fix it. And how do we do to uh, address these challenges, these kind of challenges? Well, of course, we want to uh, correct it or develop the APIs at Traffic Lab. That's the long-term sustainable solutions to do things. Correct the data, develop it, make it better, more informative. Uh, that's where everyone wants to do. But of course, SL can't do everything immediately. So we also do a lot of work by ourselves to kind of fix the data, make workarounds, temporary, to get them into Traffic Lab later and to solve problems quicker. And one example of that is what we and our users call the Jesus problem. Uh, that is that uh, in certain spots in uh, Stockholm you get suggestions to walk over water, which we know is not that easy unless you're Jesus. So, uh, and we knew that, well, SL is going to fix this, we know it, but months passed and it's like, this is a big problem for some people and they have no option. We can't, they can't use, they have nothing to do to, to plan their, their travel. So we decided, okay, let's try to fix it ourselves in the meantime. And uh, now actually both we and SL and Traffic Lab have kind of a halfway solution for it. So that's, that's one example. Another example is uh, the expectations of the information. When you start to get used to have time schedules, you suddenly want real-time information. When you have real-time information, why, do, why don't I have positions in, in the app? And this is a need that we now will help a lot of our users in uh, the travel, especially with interruptions. Have I just missed the bus? Will the late bus, will it, will it come, or the train, will, is it on its way? So we decided, okay, we know this is also going to be fixed long term by SLN uh, in, in the platform. But we decided, okay, let's do it. We know in, in some regions it's, it's already fixed, like in Gothenburg. We have a guy from West Traffic here. <laughs> so, uh, but in Stockholm it's not uh, really that easy. So we just decided that, okay, let's fix it. And that's also an interesting part uh, because it actually gets this phone directly connected to the vehicle. And Peter will tell you a little bit more about that. The third thing we have to do to address the rel reliability of the data is to design the UI for errors. We know some things can't be fixed right now. It's too small or it's... It's just not prioritized. Other things are more, more important. But we should at least design the UI to address this specific user. We know this bus has a prob problem. So instead of giving up and crying and uh, send angry notes to our customer forum, <laughs> uh, then you can do like this. If you do this setting or if you actually do this kind of search, you will find a good suggestion. Uh, but the fourth and, and still the most important way to develop the data is the community. To work with the community to actually provide, start to provide better information. Uh, we, re we recently 
uh, released uh, information in the app about which exit to go in the subway and entrance. And this has been a high demand for a long time. And so we, we thought, okay, this is not going to be fixed very quickly, long term, because there are some, some challenges when you work long term that you don't need to think about short term, like how can we maintain this data? Uh, short term, you can fix it now. So we started to work with another happy coder who actually had gathered the data himself. So now you can actually find the, the exits. And uh, when we released it just a couple of months ago, uh, our users were like, yeah, <laughs> and it was written about, and it was like a big thing. In six months, probably all everyone has this information. But this is sometimes critical to get to your appointment in time. So we decided to fix it. And, and now we're going to dig in a bit in, uh, into the feature where is the bus, the position of the bus. It's, it's a bit interesting in this uh, place uh, since it shows you how many possibilities we start to have now when we connect uh, our phones to the actual vehicles. And I will leave the word to Petter. Thank you. Yeah. I will talk a little bit more about the technical stuff behind this. And it's not only for Reasi Stockholm, and it, it's for um, all, our, our, all of our buses. We operate over 3,500 buses in the Nordic countries. And uh, nearly 80% of them are connected and uh, equipped with our IT platform. Uh, we started to build this platform about six years ago, and uh, at that time there were several standalone systems in the bus, um, and our mission was to, to combine them into one system that, that where each part could communicate with the, each other. And uh, we call that platform Nubina Mobile Extension. And it consists of a central computer that keeps track of things in the bus. It's a, similar to a Raspberry Pi, if you know that. It's a bit faster and, and has different connectors, and it comes in a metal case that's suitable for, uh, for vehicles. Uh, the platform also has uh, Ethernet network, mobile communication, actually two mobile networks to get uh, good coverage when the bus is traveling. And uh, a couple of sensors and, uh, and the driver screen. It's an Android-based uh, screen for the driver. And that's a basic platform in uh, Nubina mobile extension. To that, you can add several other things. So other systems or other sensors or whatever you can think of you want to, to have in the bus. And in the base platform that we have in every bus, we have Echo Driving. It's very important for us to be, to be a green company and to learn the drivers to, to drive carefully. So Echo Driving is uh, one part of the th base equipment. Another important feature is alcohol lock. So the driver can't start the bus without uh, blowing in, in the alcohol lock. And it, it's connected, so it actually sends a signal back to our uh, traffic center that sees if the driver uh, can't drive the bus. And then they have to send out a new driver. And of course, we have a GPS positioning well, in the bus. It actually buses. happens. But <laughs> it happens, <laughs> sadly times. no. <laughs> Um, then you, in, in other areas, you can add other features to this base platform. So, for example, in south of Stockholm, we have infotainment screens in the roof of the, inside the buses. And we have inner and outer signage uh, for the vehicles. And everything is connected to this common platform. But how do we get all these things to talk to each other. We found a protocol called MQTT. I don't know if... Any, have you heard about MQTT? <coughs> oh, it's a couple of people. Thank you. MQTT is a protocol developed by IBM, IBM in the late 90s. 
and uh, has since then become an open standard and was approved by ISO as, uh, in, the, in June this year. But we are using MQTT as a standard for communicating between all these devices on board the bus. Uh, and we also are a member of a European organization called IT for Public Transport. And they work with uh, standards for uh, vehicles and public transport in, in Europe. And we are trying together with several other organizations in, in Sweden to influence them to use MQTT as one of their standards for, for the vehicle communication. MQTT works around the central broker. It uses a published subscriber pattern. So in the bottom here we have different sensors. We have a passenger counter sensor, a GPS antenna and a door sensor. And above that, we have different interface programs that listens to these sensors and with a value change, publishes messages to, the, to this broker. And then above that, we have programs or systems that uses this information. So they subscribe for, for example, the passenger counter system subscribes for door changes and the passenger counter. And then they can figure out, okay, the door is open, so now I should start counting passengers going in and out of the bus. And we also have a position tracker that keeps track of where the bus is. And all this happens on board the bus, but we also need to send information back to our backend and, and later to, to the app Resi Stockholm. And the, then we are using the field gateway that sends messages to our backend. And this is a very simple example of a program with MQTT. It's really easy to use. Uh, this is not a production-ready code, but it's, it's simple enough. So you, first you define some constants, and the most important thing is your topic that you want to, to listen to. Then you start the program, initialize MQTT, and just do a connection to the broker. When the connection is made, we get a call back. They say the connection is OK. And then we say, OK, I want to subscribe to this topic. I want to know when something happens in this topic. And lastly, when something changes, when the position of the bus changes, we get this call back and can take the data and push it back to our back end. It's a very simple program. It, this does not compile, and it's not the version we are using on board the buses. Uh, what happens next? The buses, or our IoT units, as we call them, they are sending this data into our Azure backend. Actually, we are building this just now, so it's not in production. We have an old legacy backend on-prem where, where we use this stuff today. And it pushes this data into an event hub. It's a part of Microsoft Azure. And it's a queue where you can push a lot of data in very, very fast. And then it sits there waiting for someone to pick it up and, and take care of it. And that someone is a program running in app service. So in app service, we pick out data from the queue in event hub, combine it with some data from our back office, and then publish it again in uh, our API, and that's done through IPA management and other Azure component. We also store the information for long-term usage. And then we send the information to the backend of Resi Stockholm, so that the app then can show on a map where the bus is. It's not released yet. I it's not released yet. It's, very, it's very uh, soon. in the near future. <laughs> yeah, very soon. So, very soon. <laughs> No promises. <laughs> yeah, we, and we also we'll see be, that yeah. we can release this API, maybe, to other apps and other providers. Maybe directly through our API management, or probably more likely through uh, Traffic Lab. And uh, with that, we are nearly finished. Some uh, conclusions and takeaways. So, collaborate with the community. 
take use other people and, and get feedback and, and help them and then your products will improve. Yeah, so the community, yeah, exactly. That, that's both be part of the community and when you're maybe not, when you're a commercial actor or something, work together and it will end up to the best for all of our uh, customers. Uh, we should also design for change, as Travis, uh, we just repeat that message again, that we know these things are going to change, there are some stable protocols and stable things, but we have to use platforms that can easily adapt to new uh, data sources or new technologies that arise. Yeah, and use standards, don't invent everything yourself. Other people are smarter than you, so <laughs> <laughs> use that and you, you gain from it. And also experiment uh, with the data. What can you do with the data from the bus? We just showed you very little uh, today, but there are many things to do. So please experiment and you're more than welcome to come to us if you... Uh, need some vehicles or something. <laughs> <laughs> or if you build an, a better app than ours, yeah, then, exactly. then we can talk about it later. <laughs> yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you.